Finally, the lights went down and the theater grew dark, and we saw our first images of the movie, which were a little disappointing. A car pulling a trailer down a lonely rural road. No bad guys, no big stick, but we did see a bit of inspiring text on screen. A motion picture suggested by certain events in the life of Buford Pusser, Sheriff of McNary County, Tennessee, a living legend. A living legend, it said, and we were going to meet him in a few weeks. I was also encouraged by seeing in the opening credits the name Richard X. Slattery, an actor who was notorious for playing tough bad guys. No doubt he would meet the big stick at some point, and he probably had it coming to him. After several minutes of what I considered boring stuff, the setup of Pusser retiring from wrestling, moving back to his hometown, etc., we finally get to our first moment of genuine excitement, Pusser's initial visit to the Lucky Spot. Here we see the establishment's women getting friendly with the male customers, drinking, gambling, and the event that stopped us all in our tracks. Brenda Benet walking into the bar wearing a see-through top. Strangely enough, no moms, including mine, were taking their kids out of the theater. I was about to learn a very important lesson about sex in the movies, that on-screen nudity was not always about arousal. Later in the film, we see a naked woman who'd been the recipient of a brutal beating. This was something I'd never experienced, an image of sexuality and violence. There was, and still is, something wrong about it, and I didn't like it. I wasn't aroused by this later scene, but rather disgusted and probably a little scared. Of course, the main reason we were excited about seeing the film was to watch Pusser bust some heads, which he certainly does. In my 11-year-old mind, this was way better than Billy Jack. Although Walking Tall contains nowhere near the violence you see in many contemporary films, it was quite shocking for me and my friends. We probably didn't think about it then, but I'm sure our parents were less concerned about the on-screen nudity we saw than the violence we were digesting. Maybe they knew that we might try to recreate some of the scenes from the movie the same way we'd done for Billy Jack. We all left the theater pumped up, excited to meet the real Buford Pusser in person. When that night finally arrived, our little church was packed, not only with our regular congregation, but also with people from all over town, including newspaper reporters, photographers, all kinds of people. It was standing room only, and I could see people waiting outside to get in. As we waited, I remember being close enough to Pastor Ballard to hear him whisper to one of his deacons, I wish we could get this many people to show up on a Sunday morning. Then something happened at the church entrance. Camera flashes bombarded the foyer and grew brighter as the crowd began to part, allowing entrance to one of the tallest, most intimidating looking men I'd ever seen. And yes, he was carrying a big stick. In that moment, I learned a valuable lesson. While actors often look like the people they portray, there's a huge difference between the two. Compared to the real Buford Pusser, Joe Don Baker was a pretty boy. Take a look at this photo of Pusser with short hair taken sometime after his recovery from the brutal attacks depicted in the film. You can see the severe damage around his left eye and particularly the mouth and jaw. The doctor who operated on Pusser said that his jaw was practically shot away. In the second photo, taken several years later, the stitches around the eye are much more visible, but Pusser has his hand to his chin, covering most of the damage to his jaw. That photo, and this one, shows what Pusser looked like the night he came to our church. I don't remember much of what Pusser said that night, although I know he mentioned the importance of doing the right thing, even if you're the only one doing it. I still remember how big he was and how tough he must have been to handle everything we saw thrown at him in the movie. Years later, contemplating the real violence Pusser suffered, 
seven stabbings, and eight shootings. I realized how sanitized the movie probably was. Another valuable cinematic lesson. When Pusser presented our pastor with a replica of the big stick from the movie, everyone was awed. We all liked Pastor Ballard already, but his level of coolness immediately soared off the charts. The moments after the event now seem painfully cliched, like the end of a Western with the hero riding off into the sunset, but that's how it felt as every kid in the audience watched outside to see Pusser get in his car and drive away. There was no doubt this was the coolest moment of our lives in small town Mississippi. My friends and I talked about the event and the movie for weeks. We didn't reenact moments from Walking Tall like we did with Billy Jack, at least not as much. No swinging of baseball bats, for which our parents were no doubt thankful. Maybe all the grown-ups in town locked up their kids' bats for several weeks, I don't know. Something about imitating Pusser seemed off-limits, almost irreverent. And while we admired and looked up to the man, we didn't imitate him. Just a few months later, we were all devastated to learn that Pusser had been killed in a single car accident in Lawton, Tennessee, driving home from the McNary County Fair on August 21st, 1974. Although police determined the fatal crash to be accidental, Pusser's friends and family believed otherwise. Just a few months earlier, he'd stood in our church. This was all too much for a 12-year-old kid to process. The total amount of time from Pastor Ballard's announcing the film screening to Pusser's death was about 18 months. When we see movies about real people, we have an impression, rightly or wrongly, of what that person is like. When and if we get a chance to meet that individual in the flesh, our impression changes positively or negatively. When that person you've met both on screen and in real life is suddenly taken away, it does something to you, especially when you're a kid. It doesn't matter that you didn't know them well, you still met them, shared an event with them, and it still affects you. I'm sure others who've met celebrities and then heard of their passing have similar experiences. We probably don't really know these people, but we act as if they do, even if we haven't met them. I felt an incredible sadness when Jimmy Stewart died in 1997. I didn't know him, never met him, or even wrote to him. But his death left me weeping on my couch as I read his obituary in the newspaper. There's a part of him that spoke to me. I saw Buford Pusser's character portrayed on screen and felt, here's a guy trying to do the right thing. I saw the actual Buford Pusser in person and felt, here's a guy who did the right thing and has the scars to prove it. When Pusser was gone, we were left with the memories of seeing him and the movie. The movie, of course, pales in comparison to the real man, but it serves to remind you of an actual person you were fortunate enough to encounter for a few moments. Although I have great admiration for director Phil Carlson's work, Walking Tall isn't a great movie, but I think it's a pretty good one. At least it's an effective one. I don't know what Pusser thought about the film, although just before his death, he was in the process of signing a contract to play himself in a sequel. Pusser seemed to be indifferent to it all, but who knows? I doubt he thought people would be still watching the film and talking about it, and him, 50 years later. Storytelling is a powerful tool, especially visual storytelling. When you add to that a personal, human element, that experience transcends storytelling and becomes a part of you, regardless of the amount of years that have passed. It can happen anywhere, even in a small Mississippi town, to a kid growing up with movies. Thanks for watching.